Imagine this. You are strolling down the street when a tall, blonde gentleman with piercing blue eyes comes up to you, offering you $100 in exchange for capturing some photographs of you. He convinces you, he charms you, he is someone who seems very calm, he is a calm person who speaks politely with respect, who conveys trust. So you are indicating yes. You proceed to go up to his apartment and when you enter, the first thing that surprises you is a horrible smell, a smell of decay, as if someone had left the freezer open and all the food accumulated for weeks and weeks had started to rot and decompose, emitting a putrid odour that permeates the entire space. You all start looking closely at the apartment and you all find in one corner an object that seems like it is from somewhere else. A sizable industrial drum, right there in the apartment of any city located in the United States of America, the USA. You guys don't understand a thing, but that calm-voiced blonde guy keeps sweet-talking you, inviting you to his bedroom. You guys are going there on one hand because you want the money he promised you for taking some photos, but also because you're curious because that tall blonde man with blue eyes has a strange charisma. You guys enter the room and see it's filled with posters of naked men on the walls. There's a TV and on the TV at that very moment The Exorcist 3 is playing which has one of the scariest scenes in movie history. Your alarms, which had been activated upon entering that floor, but which you had somehow silenced, go off again and explode when suddenly and in a moment of distraction, that man puts handcuffs on one of your wrists, approaches you, puts your head against his chest, takes out a knife and says the following phrase, tonight I'm going to eat your heart. This is not a fictional story, this is not an unreal situation that we are dealing with. Today, in the corner of Giorgio, one of the most highly anticipated videos, without a doubt, in the history of this channel, and it is already nearly a decade old. We're talking about nothing more and nothing less than the absolutely real history, without fiction, without lies, documented of the life of one of the most famous, most depraved, most sexually deviant serial killers in the entire history of humanity, Jeffrey Lewis Dahmer, better known as the Milwaukee Cannibal, who has just acquired an incredible media importance worldwide thanks to a recently created series that has been a huge success. Here, I'm going to tell the story just as it happened. Y'all know that in any TV show, even in one as realistic as the one that just came out, there's fiction, there's lies, there's exaggerations, there's romanticized characters. In point of fact, without a doubt, the very first idealized character of the entire series is Jeffrey himself, personally. Here, you will know the truth and nothing but the truth. I hope you guys are ready because it's going to be a tense journey, it's going to be a journey that at times is very unpleasant, but also extremely interesting. Without further ado, let's begin. But before that, I have two news pieces to share. I know you'll love them. The initial point is that Halloween week is rapidly approaching here in Giorgio's Corner. For all of you who were inquiring, naturally, you will have Halloween week 2022 on your preferred channel, which I trust is this particular one. Our project will commence on Wednesday, October 26th and conclude on the 31st of the same month, which is Halloween Day, marking the end of our work. Every single day, a video with a creepy theme is posted. This is the first piece of news. Additionally, I am extremely honored, proud, and satisfied to inform you that my new book, titled Such Is Life, will be available for purchase starting from November 3rd. I know the title is tough, I know the title is like a slap in the face, that's how I am on the book cover on one of the covers, but it's really a bit of the definition of life that I want to convey. In the end, it's not just a book where I explain my philosophy of life, the pragmatic way I face problems, this global crisis in mental health, the damage caused by social media, the unreal and controllable damage of hatred, Regardless, a compilation of reflections that I genuinely hope you thoroughly enjoy. The book is set to be released on November 3rd. I'll leave the reservation link here in the description of this same video in case you're curious to read it, in case you want to support me, in case you want to know how I think about many topics, because the truth is that it would be a spectacular honour for me if you had this fucking life in your homes. I won't beat around the bush anymore. Let's now get into the horrifying story of the Milwaukee Cannibal. 
Jeffrey L. Dahmer is born on May 21st, 1960 in the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, United States of America. And within his parents and within his family, we encounter the initial of the great differential characteristics of Jeffrey Dahmer in comparison to other serial killers. Usually, and we've seen it here, they come from weird dysfunctional families, in some cases with abusive parents. Well, not present here. In this particular place, we have some parents with their flaws, and some of them are highly significant and will be of great importance in explaining certain behaviours of Jeffrey. But under no circumstances do they completely elucidate or justify the exceptionally deviant behaviour of this killer. Seriously, without exaggeration, we're talking about one of the most depraved psycho killers in all of history. The actions this individual has undertaken are difficult for me to comprehend. If it were not for the numerous photographs, the supporting evidence, he provided a detailed explanation himself, as they are among the strangest, most abhorrent and most repulsive deeds that can be carried out using a human body. But we will check that and see it later. Let us get back to the family. His father, Lionel Herbert Dahmer, is a chemical researcher, a cultured person with studies, but he was very, very rarely at home. So we could have a conversation about an absent father, a father who did not give him affection, maybe did not give him the attention that a special child like Jeffrey needed. His mother, Joyce Annette Dahmer, was a more complicated person, a very hypochondriac person. She spent hours and hours and hours in bed and demanded a lot of attention. Instead of giving attention to her son, she would nag him, she needed him, but I repeat, without reaching psychological abuse, without becoming an abusive mother, without becoming a complete mess of a person. How did the parents get along with each other? Well, not too good. With the father being away from home for many hours and the mother being a little complicated, they argued a lot. Actually, years later, the mother had an affair, the father found out, and that was the reason for the parents' divorce. But it was when Jeffrey was a grown person, 18 years old, but during his childhood, his adolescence, he had to put up with, yes indeed, a lot of fights and parents who didn't show him affection and they didn't show it to each other either. His father, who has been a major supporter in the life of this killer, even becoming one when everything was already known, but we'll discuss that later. His father always loved him, always respected him, even if he didn't show it in many cases, he cared about that little Jeffrey who was often there at home without saying anything, quiet, withdrawn. So I was urging him, almost compelling him to be sociable with others, to interact with the other children, because I believe Jeffrey was an extremely introverted individual. Dharma himself has explained it wasn't exactly like that, but rather he sometimes found himself in violent situations for a young child. Arguments, verbal attacks between parents, he simply withdrew into himself. But it's not that he was so introverted, but rather that he didn't feel comfortable enough at home, perhaps to show his character for whatever reasons. The young Jeffrey Dahmer initiates his obsession at an incredibly early age, displaying a highly peculiar fixation that sets him apart from his peers. He was deeply fascinated, irresistibly drawn to the guts, to the insides of animals, especially dead animals, finding their anatomy intriguing and captivating. There are several versions that explain the possible origin. Some say that one day Jeffrey was listening to his father perform a vivisection or some kind of analysis on a small animal, and the sound of the viscera, the sound of bones breaking, clicked in his head and he became absolutely intoxicated, eventually combining this with sex in a few years. According to some accounts, it was Jeffrey Dahmer, the notorious serial killer, who experienced a profound fascination and an overwhelming desire to touch and explore the internal organs of a dissected frog during a high school biology class. This incident allegedly occurred at the school both Dahmer and the narrator attended during their childhood. Jeffrey, since he didn't have much control, would often leave home, go down the road, on the highway, and whenever he found a dead animal, he would pick it up, keep it, and start making those cuts himself, looking at what was inside, touching it. We are conversing about a young child who already possesses that morbid fascination for something so peculiar and out of the ordinary. Jeffrey is in the process of growing up, and unfortunately his fascination with blood, organs, and guts not only doesn't disappear, but it actually increases and combines with his sexual awakening, creating a complex mix of interests and emotions. Here are two topics to talk about. The first thing is that he was gay. 
Since he first feels attracted to others, he realizes that he is attracted to men at a time when it wasn't as easy as it can be now to say that you are gay. And in a context of strong Catholicism, in a context where being like that, being so different, could be a problem not only for you, but also for your family. And the other thing we need to talk about is that not only does he feel attraction towards men, but he also feels attraction towards absolute domination, towards subjugation, towards that concept, towards that idea of taking a child, a teenager, a friend, another man, dominating him in the most extreme ways, killing him, cutting him open and engaging in all kinds of relationships with whatever remains. This is a depiction of Jeffrey Dahmer during his teenage years. What were once distant fantasies, almost idyllic in his mind and something he never thought would become real as he grows stronger physically, as he becomes a more powerful and resilient man, they start to transform into concrete plans for the future. He had a vivid erotic fantasy of overpowering, murdering and engaging in every imaginable activity with a hitchhiker. It was an idea that I had in my mind, but I never really thought it would actually happen because all things considered, with his absolutely perverse ideas inside his brain, on the outside, he appeared to be a more or less normal guy with a very dark sense of humour that often bordered on the macabre. In fact, he even gained fame in high school for impersonating individuals with mental disabilities, specifically those with cerebral palsy. He wore some performances that even his friends, his colleagues referred to as amazing. And it was something that you could do anywhere without any kind of shame, putting on a show, falling down, drooling, all with a very dark, very black sense of humor. Well, this guy who had friends, who was a relatively sociable person, but who deep down had those ideas that he thought he would never fulfill. But one day he was traveling on the road and encountered a hitchhiker and pondered, what should I do? Should I stop? Or keep going and he always explains that unfortunately his urge his desire to destroy that man to crush him and then have relations with the corpse got the best of him so he turned around and headed towards his first victim Stephen Mark Hicks he was a hitchhiker who had come from a rock concert with his shirt slightly unbuttoned that really turned Jeffrey on I couldn't stop thinking about what would be underneath not just under the shirt we're talking about under the muscle, under the bone that would be in there. So he said to this guy, Hey, why don't you come over to my place and we can have a few drinks and enjoy a relaxed evening together? On their way home, Stephen starts discussing girls. Jeffrey realizes then that there won't be any sexual opportunities between them. However, ideas continue to crowd in his head. Therefore, in a moment of madness, she seizes a dumbbell that she already possesses, strikes Stephen with maximum force, leaps onto him, and using the bar of the dumbbell itself, scans him to death. At that moment, for a killer, two things can happen. You get scared, you think, what have I just done? Savor the present moment. What are your opinions on the choice that Jeffrey made, everyone? The second one without a shadow of a doubt. Utilizing his own hands, he made an attempt to open Stephen's chest and he achieved success, proceeding to engage in masturbation on top of the open cavity of that lifeless corpse, that source of all his desires and obsessions, without any hesitation or remorse. His initial experience of engaging in necrophilic sexual activities would be the first of many such encounters in his life. Jeffrey is perfectly aware that what he's doing is not right, that it's not good to kill, that it's not good to have these kinds of thoughts. He wants to forget what he has done. He wants to make that absolutely macabre network of ideas disappear that he constantly has. So he discovers some sort of sanctuary in alcohol. Alcohol would be present for a significant portion of Jeffrey Dahmer's existence, transforming him into an alcoholic, which undoubtedly hindered his self-discipline and ability to lead a conventional life. His father, already divorced with a new girlfriend, is extremely worried about his son. Not because he thinks he's killing men or has thoughts of murdering men, subjugating them and doing everything with the corpses, but because he believes and knows he has a drinking problem. So he urges you to do something with your life to try, for example, going to college. So Jeffrey is signing up for Ohio State University one of the big universities in Ohio, with the intention of becoming a productive person, of leaving behind all that shit he had accumulated. 
The year was an absolute disaster. He keeps drinking like a maniac. He fails at everything. One day his father goes to visit him and discovers that the college room is filled with empty bottles. He tells him even at that moment that he will pay him more years in the USA. College is so expensive, but don't worry, she trusts him. But Jeffrey is in a completely different state, so in the end he ends up dropping out of college. His father advises him again to do something with his life, in this case son, enlist in the army. For many, the army at that time was like a lifeline for people who had behavioural issues, economic problems, problems with their parents, problems with their partners. Enlisting in the army was a way to go to a place where, in theory, they were going to give you a home, a family, food, discipline, and you would be able to learn certain things, although later you might end up in a war and end up dead in Iraq or somewhere else. But it was still a lifeline for people who were lost, as well as many others who really wanted to be soldiers. That wasn't the case for Jeffrey. How do you guys think the army thing went? Oh no, that's terrible. He kept drinking, so he was constantly having issues with his superiors. On one occasion, in 1979, his whole platoon got punished because of him and his comrades gave him a good beating. This used to be done in military training when someone messed up repeatedly, causing issues for others without any communication or reprimand. The instructors took justice into their own hands in some manner. He lasted a while in the army, but that relationship was not going to end well, so they ultimately ended up kicking him out. He goes back to Ohio and moves in with his dad. No matter what, things are not going well. Jeffrey drinks a lot. That definitely complicates matters, so ultimately he decides to go with his grandmother. Her grandmother, the only person she had ever felt any affection for, was the last person she could turn to in an attempt to find happiness. In the beginning, things go smoothly. Jeffrey manages to rebuild himself there. She goes to church with her grandmother, embracing certain Catholic ideals. Listen, Catholic individuals, a person who did everything they did. Later, he finds jobs, even in one of them, because it lasts for a certain time, thus reducing alcohol consumption. However, his intense impulses, that internal black fire he possessed, inevitably had to find a way to be expressed and manifest their explosive nature. In the year 1982, Jeffrey is apprehended for engaging in public indecency, displaying a typical and cliché act of exhibitionism by undressing in front of a group of 25 individuals, which included several children. You are just receiving a fine, but we are already observing that your self-control had some significant cracks. Let's move forward a few years to the year 1985, and here is an act that has a profound and transformative impact on your life. Let's remember that he had already killed and had managed to control himself from killing again. He's in a library, he's reading, and he approaches a guy, a dude, and gives him a piece of paper. And on paper it states that if you desire to go to the bathroom with him, he is going to require you to perform tasks. That triggers in Jeffrey Dahmer an urge that he had not experienced so intensely since he murdered Stephen Hicks. Obtain a grip, return to your home. However, that particular point is what signifies the pivotal moment between his relatively ordinary existence and his metamorphosis into one of the most perilous serial murderers in recorded history. That day everything changes for Jeffrey. He starts frequenting gay saunas at that moment, seeking his own sexual satisfaction on one hand, but also looking for victims, looking for men to dominate. He doesn't want to kill them at first. What does Jeffrey do? He goes to the saunas, drugs them, does everything with them, but many times he just stays by their side. He desires his partners, the individuals he engages in sexual activity with, to remain motionless, resembling dildos or inanimate objects devoid of independent existence, lacking their own thoughts and desires, merely serving as inert entities for him to manipulate at his discretion. But let's recall that in there, it's not just the desire for control, but also the taste for blood, guts, organs, so that macabre point was still there and was going to be stronger than ever. I'll show you how messed up Jeffrey Dahmer's head was. One day he reads in the paper that an 18-year-old boy has died and there's the funeral. Many of you might think, well, that's it. It doesn't have much more mystery because it's not someone he has known. For Jeffrey, this wasn't a problem, so he'll buy a shovel and go where the boy is buried because he wanted to have relations with the corpse. Try using the shovel to remove the dirt, but finds it's too hard, so he gives up. 
However, it is an example that I believe in some way demonstrates very clearly and accurately the mental instability of that gentleman. In 1987, Jeffrey Dahmer starts killing again, and that would be the beginning of many deaths. On September 15th of that same year, Stephen Twomey was just chilling at a bar having a drink. He approaches a tall blonde man with glasses, attractive, who starts a pleasant conversation and ends up convincing him to go with him to his hotel, the Ambassador Hotel. According to Jeffrey Dahmer, his intentions were not fatal. All I wanted was to administer drugs to him, engage in activities with him, and lie down next to him without any further motives. They proceed to the room experiencing a complete power outage and upon awakening the next morning, Jeffrey Dahmer opens his eyes to find Stephen Tuomi's lifeless body lying beside him. Blood was scattered all over the place. He himself had bruises and he came to the realization that he had unintentionally caused the death of that man without any recollection of it. And up until the day of his death, Jeffrey Dahmer consistently maintained that he did not intend to kill him and that he did not exactly recollect what transpired during that time. Perhaps substances were involved, perhaps he had a strong mental shock from killing again that his own psyche blocked the memory. In any case, Stephen Tuomi was his second victim and this is where the true madness starts for Jeffrey. During this time, Jeffrey loses control and actively seeks out victims, not just to have relationships, but specifically to kill and desecrate their bodies in a gruesome manner. During that period, he kills two additional individuals, James Doxator, who engages in horrific necrophilic acts that I won't even elaborate on, and Richard Guerrero, with whom he has an unusual manner of oral intercourse subsequent to his demise. Throughout the entirety of this criminal mess, he persisted in living with his grandmother, his grandmother did not know anything. Her grandmother simply knew that she drank too much and often brought boys home, which of course she did not like and did not make her happy at all. So ultimately, Jeffrey Dahmer departs from his grandmother's residence and begins taking care of himself. In 1989, everything could have ended. There would have been several victims, yes, but not as many or as tragic as there were afterwards. Why? Because Jeffrey Dahmer is arrested for sexually assaulting a 13-year-old boy. Child who managed to escape, alert the police, and the police quickly apprehend Jeffrey. Although I'm telling you that in this video they're not going to speak well of the police, because the police are one of the major culprits of Jeffrey Dahmer doing what he did. An ineffective police, a police force that makes mistake after mistake, here we have a perfect case a guy who has already taken the lives of several men and who has a 13-year-old child he is engaged in something suspicious with. The child manages to flee and since there's no deeper investigation to check if that individual had committed more crimes, since there isn't a truly thorough investigation with a person who had a similar profile like his, the fact of the matter is that this did not actually happen. Jeffrey's dad, Lionel, employs a first-rate attorney who is attempting to demonstrate that Jeffrey is mentally unstable, that he experiences a sense of not fitting into the real world. They play the card of schizophrenia and get a not-too-severe verdict. Jeffrey Dahmer sentenced to one year in a correctional facility, followed by five years of probation. But you see, I was already out of my mind at that moment, Jeffrey King full-on legal attack, where the logical thing is for you to behave well, to be calm, to be in control. He kills his next victim, a 24-year-old model named Anthony Sears. Jeffrey was completely captivated by that man, absolutely captivated, unable to resist his charm. I discovered him to be extremely beautiful, incredibly handsome. He enjoyed it to such an extent that subsequent to murdering him, he severed his head, removed his genitals and preserved them permanently in acetone. And wherever he was planning to reside, he was bringing along that head and that body part to his new location. We're discussing intense things that appear impossible, unreal, but are completely true. Jeffrey ends up going to juvie and doesn't even finish his sentence. Do you know what they say at 10 months? Your probation begins, you can go outside now. Do y'all think he behaved well on probation? I'm telling you, no way. He was out of control. He was a person without any kind of self-control and even though he always knew that what he was doing was not right, he didn't want to and couldn't stop. In the year 1990 is where the killing spree of a serial killer begins, right? That time when they kill more, more quickly and have more difficulty stopping. 
I am not going to go into detail about each of the encounters and each of the murders here because I think it would be a little repetitive and also unnecessary. However, I will inform you about certain things that Jeffrey Dahmer did during this period of time. First, what was your modus operandi? Well, almost always the same. He used to hang out mostly at local gay bars, pubs, looking for a guy he liked, sometimes offering them money to take photos in his room, erotic photos. If the poor victim said yes, they would leave together. One time in a hotel, in an apartment, wherever. I almost always drugged them, left them asleep, dazed. One time cow, he would strangle them and kill them. Once I had completed this, I would commence the second phase of the plan. And at this point, various types of relationships, abuses, necrophilia, and the most unimaginable horrors would come into play. Not only with the entire body anymore, but with certain portions of the body, occasionally very peculiar portions. And in many cases, all of this photographed. Did he have a camera, the famous Jeffrey Dahmer Polaroid photos, right? What is one of the most famous things besides the glasses of his not so characteristic image, the photos that he was taking of everything? And actually, I have seen the photos. I have seen several photos. They are not very hard to find. Of course, I'm not going to put anything here. Maybe I'll put an image of the photos or several blurred, censored photos. And they are deceased individuals in suggestive positions, in erotic positions, heads, limbs, skeletons, everything you can imagine at a depraved level, at a disturbed level, at the level of a genuinely insane person. I am running out of adjectives to describe the extent of their disturbing nature. Well, there you have those pictures. I don't recommend that you look for it, but since I know you'll probably do it anyway, here it goes. He has a fondness for preserving body parts, particularly bones, skulls, and a specific body part in his residence. He occasionally even goes as far as painting the skulls. We're reaching a point that's even religious, even mystical. Actually, when the police arrive, because I'm gonna tell you the conclusion, right? When he entered and saw the house, Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment, he said that more than a crime scene, it looked like a museum, a museum of horrors, but it almost seemed like an altar to dead men, to deceased men. More things that Jeffrey Dahmer did in those months of absolute hell cannibalism. I imagine that some, well, if the title of the video is his most famous nickname is the Milwaukee Cannibal, you could already imagine that he practiced cannibalism. And yes, I did practice it a lot with all sorts of components. I am not going to delve into the most succulent particulars, but he would attempt anything that was relatively consumable. Biceps, muscles, tendons, didn't matter, would try. Even made recipes. Why? Explain it, right? Or he attempted to clarify it. He carried it out because in some way he sensed that those individuals, those males, who in certain instances were highly sought after men for him, attractive, were an integral part of his own being. When he consumed the flesh of those individuals, he experienced a sensation as if he was entering into a symbiotic relationship with them and perceiving their presence within himself. Literally, probably in that case, but for him it had connotations beyond eating the flesh of a dead being. Here comes one of the craziest things he did. Check out what kind of person we're talking about. He became involved in conducting experiments and developing a type of enslaved zombies who would obediently carry out his every command without uttering a word. He did some research in chemistry books and decided to give it a try. He did it with a drill, drilling a hole in the skull of one of his victims. All of this while we're still alive, and he would add a little hydrochloric acid to them in the hope that after a while they would turn into that, into beings that would do anything that humans like him would want. This never worked, so I always had to finish them off. What did he do with the corpses? Well, for the most part, they would break them down with chemicals, but in some cases they would pile up and that smelled awful. And the neighbors? Neighbors. Actually, the series, well, there's the famous neighbor who wasn't exactly like that because she didn't live on the same floor, but rather lived further away. Well, you know, I repeat that the series makes things up, fictionalizes things, although it's quite accurate, especially very well acted. Dharma's performance is amazing. If it were a movie, it'd win the Oscar. But I'm back to reality. Let's go back to the year 1991, when he already had quite a few more victims under his belt. Because for me, this is one of the most intense moments in the whole story. Not because I did something specifically Korean, but due to the action taken by the police. Seriously, it's surreal. May 26, 1991. 
meet a 14-year-old boy named Conorak Sinza Sonfon. Sorry if I didn't say it right, because the name is complicated. A guy of Thai, Laotian, Cambodian descent, that part of the world, convinces him to come to his house for an erotic photo shoot. A 14-year-old child convinces him, takes him to his house, takes a couple of erotic photos of him, drugs him, and at that moment he was in his obsession with zombie slaves, so he performs a small trepanation on him and puts acid on him. He goes into the room, which at that particular moment was already being occupied by the dead body of his previous victim. A dead body already decomposing. The house had an awful smell, the corpse was swollen. What a horrifying sight. He leaves it there and goes to have a few beverages, thinking that he will not be able to leave that place. When he returns, he discovers the man on the street conversing with three women in his native tongue. You don't understand anything, don't panic. He approaches and tells the women that he's their friend, that he's had too much to drink, that he's not feeling well, and that he's gonna take him back home again. Women don't believe it, they call the police. The cops show up and here's where the real madness begins. In some way, Jeffrey Dahmer manages to convince the police officers that the boy in question is, astonishingly, his 19-year-old boyfriend, despite the overwhelming evidence and skepticism surrounding the case. Y'all can see the pictures, it don't seem like she's 19 years old in any universe. Jack Daniels drank a whole lot, he wasn't feeling well. Y'all gotta think that the dude was high on acid during the trepanation. What he was saying didn't make sense. I lacked energy to do almost anything. I truly don't understand how he managed to escape the house. It's strange that I could walk. Jeffrey convinces the police. The women were telling them, like, what are you guys doing? The police. And do you know what one of the cops said to one of the women? Shut up and mind your own business. They accompanied, and here is already the culmination of surrealism, they accompanied Jeffrey Dahmer and this boy, his victim, to the apartment building where the killer resided. Even when they arrived, Jeffrey, very cleverly, showed them the erotic photos of the guy to prove that they were indeed boyfriends, they were a couple, they were playful, and that nothing weird had happened there. The cops came and went. It smelled bad, they made comments, but Jeffrey always had an alibi for their presence. It's my fish, it's the pipes, it's the bathroom that I haven't closed properly. He always managed to hide it and always managed to get away with it. This individual passed away in a matter of minutes as a result of Jeffrey drilling into his head once more, pouring acid on him once more, and unfortunately this time he did not survive. Certainly, you all can imagine what occurred after that. Luckily, and despite the complete ineffectiveness of the police, almost all serial killers end up behind bars or executed in the end. Jeffrey Dahmer wouldn't be an exception. We're still in the year 1991, July 22nd, in the months between the murder of the 14-year-old boy and today, there have been quite a few more victims. I already went. He's calm because even when someone escapes, he knows the complaints won't go anywhere. Ultimately, he is murdering homosexual men whom the police have no interest in at that particular time. That's gay stuff. They thought, now they'll wake up. I killed many black people, also many African Americans. Are we on the same page, right? people who were of less significance during that time in the USA. Surely, if I had killed the son of a renowned congressman or the cousin of the mayor of Wisconsin, things would have been different and the investigation would have been much more thorough. Anyway, for several months, Jeffrey Dahmer continued to kill. Let's move on to July 22nd. As I was saying, Jeffrey approaches three individuals who are walking down the street, three individuals who look quite rough, and offers them $100 to take some nude photographs. Only one of them accepts the offer, Tracy Edwards, who would be crucial to the ability to apprehend Jeffrey Dahmer. Do you guys remember that in the introduction I explained a very macabre scene? Well, that's what happened. And then Tracy, realising that this was not a joke and that her life was genuinely in danger, begins contemplating how she can escape from this situation. Do I get aggressive right away or do I try to sweet talk my way out of it? He did the second thing. I was telling him that I was his friend, that I wasn't going to run away. And he was buying time, buying time to avoid that death. At a certain point, he tells her to go to the bathroom. Jeffrey was on the couch, and there Tracy slaps him in the face and leaves. Manages to escape with handcuffs on one of his wrists, hurry up and hit the streets. The cops are out there. They inform them of what occurred. A bizarre guy wanted to kill me. He handcuffed me. He resides over there. 
The police go, and this time, finally, and after years of absolute disaster, they begin to thoroughly examine Jeffrey's apartment. And there you can find a small amount of everything. The well-known Polaroids with numerous creepy photos to the maximum, corpses, heads. When they saw that they were discovering things, Jeffrey gets aggressive, but of course they manage to dominate him. Check out the irony. The one who always dominated, the one who was always on top, in this case the police managed to subdue him. His big dream had turned into his worst nightmare. They caught him. A very high profile case as you can imagine. At that moment it was a whole show because of how he looked physically, the type of victims he chose and of course above all because of the extreme macabre nature of his actions. The lawyers of Dharma made the claim of insanity once again, asserting that he carried out his actions because he had serious behavioural problems, mental illnesses and other related issues. The jury ended up not falling for it and sentenced him to 987 years, that is, a sentence for life with no possibility of ever getting out or being released from prison. And here, and I know that I've been watching this video for a while, something interesting happens. Jeffrey Dahmer spent a couple of years incarcerated, and why do I say a couple of years if he is not advanced in age enough to be deceased? The reason is that they killed him inside the facility. Another inmate named Christopher Starberg was the one who killed him by repeatedly hitting him with a metal bar. He not only killed him, but also another. And what are the reasons? It is believed that the person, for whatever reason, didn't have great sympathy for Jeffrey Dahmer, but also had schizophrenia. And in fact, the initial statement he made when confessing the murder was that God had commanded him to commit the act. But why did I highlight you as if there's something juicy between the moment he dies and the moment he's condemned? Well, because there is a remarkable interview occurring in there with her father that is worth witnessing. If this video, this very video is a hit and you guys give it likes like crazy, it will most likely be the first video of Halloween week in the year 2022. Geordie Wilde analysing the interview with Jeffrey Dahmer where he discloses everything, confesses all and has his father by his side for the entire conversation. Here ends this story with the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth about Jeffrey Dahmer's life. A real history of barbarity. I had been wanting to bring it for a long time, it's true that now with the series it's going great for me, but it's one of the ones I have probably had on my list since the beginning. I possess a word with an enormous list of names, among which are the most renowned, including Ed Gein, whom I will also bring one day, well-liked folklore characters such as Jack the Ripper, whom I believe I can provide a substantial amount of valuable data. One very, very, very interesting story, the very Zodiac that hasn't been caught yet. Well, I have a ton of cases and a bunch of crazies and a whole lot of criminals and a whole bunch of psychopaths and a whole bunch of psycho killers to bring here to Giorgio's Corner. And I recall on November 3rd it's released That's Life, my new book. If you're curious, if you want to support me, you have the link to purchase it here in the description, November 3rd. But if you're smart, you're going to make a reservation because the stock might run out because we think it's going to do really well. My philosophy in life is to make you think more and entertain you. If I can achieve that, I'm satisfied, okay? My goal is to provoke thought and provide entertainment. If I can do that, even in a small way, it's a success. Is that clear? That's it, a big kiss. See you next week, buddy. I promised you that this year we would have a Halloween week and damn, if we're not gonna have it, it's gonna be a good one. See you later.